Before going into the details of my long captivity of four years and three months among them, the reader must indulge me for a while as I give a short history of myself and parents prior to my life among the fierce band of Comanches. Both of my parents were natives of Virginia. Father was born in Henry County, at the old family residence of Patrick Henry, who is his great-grandfather on his father's side. John Fontaine, his grandfather, married Martha, the oldest daughter of Patrick Henry, and they named their firstborn after Patrick Henry, and Patrick Henry Fontaine married Nancy Dabney Miller, and my father, Reverend Edward Fontaine, was the oldest child and first grandson of the immortal Patrick Henry. My father was born on Leatherwood Creek in Henry County on the 5th of August, 1800. My mother was born at the old homestead of the Murrays in Albemarle County, Virginia, on September 13, 1805. Her father moved to Tennessee when she was an infant, and Murray County was named after him. On the 10th of September, 1828, they were married at the old homestead near Columbia in Murray County and went at once to Texas with Stephen F. Austin, who had received valuable grants of land and other inducements from the Mexican authorities to induce immigration and the colonization of the territory. My grandfather took up his residence at Pontotoc in Pontotoc County, Mississippi in 1834 and for several years under President Jackson's administration, was Surveyor General of Public Lands south of Tennessee and had his land office at Pontotoc. When a child only six years old, I was carried to see my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and kinfolks in and around Pontotoc. I well remember the looks of the great logs the Negroes were hewing in long straight lines to build the houses to live in. They were a novelty to me as my home had ever been a tent, and I asked my grandfather how he was going to take all those great logs with him when he went to move his tent. This, of course, provoked a laugh at my expense and exposed my ignorance to the crowd, and my mother had to tell them that I had never lived in a house but always in a tent that could be moved about to suit our nomadic life on the prairies of our Texas home. I had several boyish escapades that were somewhat ludicrous while we stayed at Grandfather's. One I well remember. Grandpa was very fond of cats, and he had a dozen or more that at each meal he would feed out on the brick walk at the front porch. And there were a number that lived down on the lot around the stables and barns, and these were wild and would not come about the house. Grandma constantly complained that the cats destroyed the young chickens and ought to be destroyed. So at her suggestion, Grandpa offered us a picayune for each pair of cat ears we would bring him. Under the guidance of Billy Bradford, my uncles, Edmund Winston, and Charles Fontaine, we organized a brigade of cat hunters and proceeded to destroy all the cats we could find around and about the barns and stables. But the cats seemed to have had warning of our intentions, and only two or three yielded us their ears after a long and exciting chase but near the house we found several tame ones. These we did not kill, but merely cut off their ears. That night I offered the spoils of the chase to my grandfather and received fifty cents in picayunes for my reward. But the next morning, when the old man went to feed his pets, seven hoisted their tails and came rushing up to him, bloody around their heads and minus their ears. He said nothing on the porch as he gazed at his shorn pets, but he walked out to a young, long-limbed elm and cut a nice, keen switch, went into his office, and called me in. I had to obey. As I entered, he asked me if I still had the money he paid me for catching the wild cats out at the barn. Yes, sir, I said. Well, give it back to me. I paid you too much. He held out his hand, and I dropped the picayunes one by one into it. He took out seven and then handed me back the rest, and I started to go, but he said, I am not through my settlement with you yet. Don't I owe you something else? I knew by intuition what was coming. My conscience told me this, and I answered, No, sir. But I do, he said, and I'm going to pay you now. 
and he did, and it made an impression on me that has never been effaced. Upon another occasion, to get revenge for this whipping, I played a practical joke on him that was cruel in the extreme. Every afternoon after dinner, he would take a nap for a few minutes, and then get up and go in his garden and weed or work among his vegetables for exercise and recreation. On the day I remember so well, it was wash day, and the women had been washing. They had stretched a clothesline from the post around the well to another in front of the back window of the office in which Grandpa took his nap. I heard him snoring and knew that he was sound asleep. I caught two of the largest old tomcats that were asleep on the gallery, and handling them gently, I tied their tails together and slipped up to the clothesline and threw them across it and then hid behind the well curb and shed to watch the outcome. The cats at once made their presence known, and soon I heard Grandfather say, Scat! in no uncertain tones. But his voice only increased the din of the warring cats and brought Grandpa to the window to see the meaning of the turmoil. I was peeping from my hiding place, enjoying the fun, and he got a glimpse of me, and out in his slippers he came, cut the strings that bound the cats, and came straight to my hiding place. He stripped a limb from a young peach tree, and for a minute or two, I had some sure enough fun in the most exaggerated form. On one occasion, my curiosity was aroused by hearing the Negroes talking about ghosts. I wanted to see one, and old Anthony, one of the oldest of the Negroes, told me that I would have to go to a graveyard among the dead people and sit right still until midnight, and a ghost would come right up to me, and I could see him in the dark as he would be white. So one night I slipped out of my trundle bed and went across the orchard and into the graveyard and got up on a tombstone and waited. How long I sat, I have no idea. But presently I was aroused by the shaking of a bush that hung over the gravestone and touched me and saw something white seemingly bowing to me and almost in reach. It came a little nearer and I made a spring and grabbed at it. It gave a quick whirl, lunged forward with a loud bop, and revealed by its bleat an old billy goat that I was familiar with around the lot. My disappointment was intense, and from that day to this, I have had my doubts about there being any real ghosts. I had another witch theory exploded in a somewhat similar way not long after my ghost adventure. Only a few miles from Grandpa's there lived two very old people, kind, gentle, and as hospitable as could be found. They lived alone in a large, rambling house with upstairs rooms. The children of this old couple were married and scattered around, and frequently with their children would spend days and weeks at the old homestead. I paid them a visit one evening, and a storm came up in darkness, and they kept me until morning. When bedtime came, they sent a servant with me upstairs and put me to bed in a large room with an old high-post covered bedstead hung all around with heavy curtains above and below the place I lay on. The Negro helped me to undress and put on my night robe, which was much too large for me, lifted me up into the tall bed, threw the curtains together, and left me alone. I heard her footsteps echoing down the stairs, then all was silent as death. I lay for a long time thinking of all the stories I had heard about ghosts and about this old woman in whose house I now was, being a cruel witch that liked to ride horses at night and take bad boys away from their homes and not let them see their mother or father any more. I was satisfied on the ghost question, but the witch was a known quantity, for I had read of the witch of Ender in the Bible, and I had no doubts on that line, and here I was all alone in a real witch's house and miles from home. I had been told by Nancy Ann and old Anthony and other servants at Grandpa's that as long as I worked my big toe and my right foot that the witches would not and could not bother me. I thought of these things in a wide-awake state for some time, when all of a sudden I was roused by the sound of footsteps coming up to my room. They were not those of a human being, for these feet had claws. I could hear them strike the steps as they ascended the stairs. I was satisfied that the witch had transformed herself into some great animal, and was coming to take me away. I worked my big toe with wonderful rapidity, but it did not seem to have the desired effect. 
The witch came on right to my chamber door, and I heard it screech as she pushed it open, and I heard her claw strike the floor as she approached the bed and felt the curtains part and heard her heavy breathing as she seemed to stand and look down upon me. It was very dark and I could see nothing. All of a sudden, as I was doing my best working my toe, a tremendous body lit upon me, nearly mashing me down through the bed, and I could feel the quick throb of the witch's heartbeat. Mine almost ceased. I lay like a dead being for some time, with the panting witch lying heavily upon me, and making no effort to do me an injury. I took my head from under the cover and stretched my hand out to feel her. The relief I experienced was beyond expression. For instead of being grabbed by the long, bony claws of a horrid witch, I was greeted by the warm breath of old Ossian, our big Newfoundland dog. I grabbed him and drew him under the cover, and in a few minutes I was safe in the land of Nod. My dog had missed me and followed my pony's track and was at the house before the storm, and when the night came on he made so much noise that the servant let him in. He came right up to me, and thus for all time ended my belief in witches. We spent several months with my grandparents, and I think they were glad to bid me goodbye. Upon returning to my prairie home in my old Polish exile, I practiced daily with my rifle at the deer, turkeys, and prairie chickens that were in herds and flocks on every hand, and became wonderfully expert with it. Under my old tutor, I made progress with my lessons in mathematics and all the higher branches that he taught by the text and by lectures. In 1837, we paid my grandparents another visit, and my father and the Honorable Jacob Thompson, who was afterwards Secretary of the Interior under President Buchanan with William Bradford, formed a law partnership at Pontotoc. My father and Jacob Thompson entered into some large tracts of land in the Mississippi Bottom on what is now known as Bear Lake in Tunica County, and in the winter of 1837 and 1838, they took a surveyor and a large force of men, wagons, and mules, and four Chickasaw Indians, the latter as hunters to keep them in fresh meat. We camped on some mounds just south and west of the present station of Dundee on the Yazoo and Mississippi Valley Railroad on the east bank of Bear Lake. Here, with Fat Bob as my Indian companion and guide, I hunted as far south as Ward Lake. Father and Jacob Thompson followed the surveyor's trails and superintended the deadening of the lands. Returning to Texas in 1838, we moved up the Colorado River to the present site of the city of Austin and laid it out. Our tent was pitched in the center of what is now Pecan Avenue, and in laying off the city, a small triangle was left to mark the spot, as ours was the first tent pitched, and ours the first horses ever staked by a white man's hand in that region. Being the first male child born in the colony, I was allowed to hold and help drive the first tent pen, and to aid in staking the first horse on the site of what was to be the capital city of the largest and greatest state in the grandest republic the world has ever known. It was on this occasion that I first felt that I had a place in the world. In 1839, we built a substantial double-walled, four-room, auditor's, comptroller's, and treasurer's log house and a heavy double-walled house lined with earth eight inches thick of hand-sawed boards for a general land office and a large roomy capital building of hand-sawed boards. We then stored all the archives of the state away nicely for the officers in charge whenever their services should be required. President Sam Houston, concluding that Austin was too far out on the confines of civilization for their safety, decided that he would remove them back to Washington, where they would not be so exposed. So he sent some commissioners, headed by old Deaf Smith, to remove them. But they met a snag and did not carry out Sam Houston's directions. All the men were absent from the city upon their arrival on an Indian scout, and only seven grown women and five boys, myself the oldest boy, and one girl composed the whole white population of the city when the commissioners appeared. Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Haney, and Mrs. Swisher had the keys to the buildings, and they told the commissioners that they could not get the archives, nor could they enter the buildings until the men returned. The commissioners became indignant at the delay, and they said they would break down the doors and remove them anyhow, 
as they were clothed with the power and had the authority to do so from the president. My mother replied that when they broke open those doors and removed those records, it would be over the dead bodies of every woman and child in that place. The ladies loaded a small six-pound cannon and sighted it at the entrance to the land office and gave me and three other boys rifles and lit a piece of hemp rope and primed the cannon, ready to defend the archives of the state from being removed. And as Deaf Smith stepped upon the front porch into the vestibule of the land office, they touched the match to the cannon and the ball into the building just in front of Deaf Smith, covering him with dust and splinters. We boys lay behind a small breastwork ready to fire with deadly aim at the word, but it never came. The commissioners beat a hasty retreat, and the archives were saved. The hole made in the wall of the old land office by the six-pound shot on that fateful morning was afterward closed up, and a metal tablet marked the place, with the history of the occurrence engraved thereon to perpetuate the event to the coming generations. The men, upon their return, thanked the gallant women for their brave acts, and said that it was better than they could have done, as they would have had to obey the President and give the archives up. It is a pleasure to me now at this distant day to recall those stirring times in the early days of my native state, the founders of which had in their veins the best and purest blood of this great nation. It was among these noble men and women that my early childhood was spent, and the memory of them clings to me and cannot be obliterated.